policemen on patrol. But this is not a typical beat in an average city. This is Kosovo, a war-torn region of southern Serbia. And for these US military policemen on a NATO peacekeeping mission, it's life-threatening duty. The easiest way to describe Kosovo, it's a country that has no money and has no law. Here, one minute, a child may approach requesting food, and the next minute, another may be concealing a hand grenade. My soldiers would be performing our daily missions of various security, and there was no telling when there would be a confrontation or some sort of a problem that could erupt anywhere within the country. I mean, you could never be prepared for it, but you always had to be ready for it. Law enforcement training in areas such as riot control, distinguishing combatant from non-combatant, and non-lethal apprehension of suspects. Take him down. Is what separates MPs from typical combat soldiers. And it's what makes them valuable to peacekeeping operations. My first thing is not to open fire. I'm going to assess the situation. I'm going to report. I'm going to uh, deal with the situation here. When it exceeds my capability, I'm going to get somebody in to assess. That's what we're used for. MPs are increasingly a force of choice. Commanders headed for areas of civil strife anywhere in the world would not leave home without them. Yet this was not always the case. It took more than a century and a half for US leaders to recognize the full value of their military police. MPs can trace their roots back to George Washington's Continental Army. Continental Army never exceeded 17,000 men. This was the core of Washington's army. But the great majority of those who fought in the American Revolution were militiamen. They were farmers who came to fight during the summertime, go home to harvest their crops, stay the winter, come back in the spring after they planted their crops again. And these were undisciplined, untrained, and uh, usually unruly men. To pass the long days of tedium between battles with British forces, Continental soldiers often drank, brawled, robbed one another, and left regimental areas without permission. Washington brought order to the ranks by forming a special unit of troops to serve as policemen. Borrowing the name of the police unit in the French army, he dubbed his new peacekeepers the Marchaussee Corps. To both recruit and lead these new policemen, Washington called upon a veteran of the highly disciplined Prussian military, Captain Bartholomew von Hare. He was from the Dutch colonies or the German colonies in Pennsylvania. And in fact, he recruited all of those initial members of the Marche Corps out of those German colonies. So the first uh, men who were in this corps were German immigrants. So good. Von Hare armed his men heavily. They patrolled the army camps, arresting drunkards, rioters, and thieves, and remained watchful for signs of enemy spies. During battle, the Marchaussee Corps guarded rear areas, gathering stragglers, controlling prisoners of war, and protecting baggage and supply lines from attack. In cases of high crime or flagrant desertion, they also carried out executions. At the Battle of Yorktown, Marchaussee troops served as General Washington's personal bodyguards. While the Continental Army fought British attackers on land, the Continental Navy battled marauding English frigates that threatened U.S. coastal waterways. Military discipline on Navy ships was the responsibility of each ship's master at arms, usually the toughest, burliest enlisted sailor. Master at arms duties as a subordinate to the first lieutenant was to make sure that discipline is kept aboard the ship, that no sailors desert or leave the ship on a without authorization, to inspect any and all things that are brought aboard the ship, to take care of any prisoners, either 
naval prisoners or prisoners of war, and to make sure that the ship's company is familiar with the use of small arms and with basic infantry tactics. The master at arms tradition stretched back to the reign of Charles I of England, and it continues to this day. On land, however, the end of the war brought an end to the Marchaussee Corps. With the defeat of the British, the citizen soldiers of the Continental Army returned to their farms and businesses. Shortly afterwards, General Washington ordered his police corps disbanded. For the next several decades, units within the small standing U.S. Army would police themselves. On April 12, 1861, Confederate guns fired on Fort Sumter, the federal military post in Charleston Harbor. Once again, citizen soldiers sprang to arms. But hasty organization, abbreviated training periods, and inexperienced commanders bred discipline problems in the ranks. En route to Bull Run, the first major battle of the war, Union troops under General Irvin McDowell strayed from the ranks as they passed southern homes and farms. And they started pillaging, they started taking whatever they wished along the way. Now, McDowell, General McDowell may not have uh, objected to them taking the property, but it was undisciplinary. McDowell ordered the formation of a provost corps, a military police force, to keep soldiers in line. Like their predecessors in the American Revolution, these military policemen prevented soldiers from plundering, enforced curfews, seized contraband, tracked deserters, and when necessary, joined in the fight. Later in the war, some of these duties passed to the VRC, the Veterans Reserve Corps, a secondary police unit comprised of wounded veteran soldiers. These were men who were not wounded beyond use. They were wounded beyond service in a line unit. So they were formed into companies, battalions, uh, to, to perform military police duties. In other words, they protected the commissaries. They protected the uh, quartermaster depots. They are the ones who escorted prisoners of war to the uh, prisons in the north. They also administered enlistment stations. But in 1863, voluntary enlistment in the Union Army virtually ceased. The signing of the Emancipation Proclamation outraged the working class, the primary source of enlistees. In response, Congress instituted a draft and tasked the VRC with enforcing it. The Irish in the North were on the bottom rung of the economic ladder. They were the ones with the low-paying jobs. They were afraid that if they fought with the Union Army and freed these blacks in the South, they would come north and take their jobs. So they were not supportive of the Union effort at that time. So when this draft came in, they revolted. Riotous mobs attacked VRC troops, burned draft centers, and assaulted blacks in cities across the North. In mid-July, a draft riot in New York City lasted five days. The violence reached such an extent that the army finally called upon troops still in the Gettysburg area in the aftermath of the battle. 100,000 soldiers rushed north to aid VRC police and bring the chaos to an end. Despite their valuable contribution to the Union victory, at war's end, all army police were once again eliminated by Congress. Following the pattern set after the revolution, Regular units in the smaller post-war military would be left to police themselves. It would take new threats in a new century to prove the need for a permanent force of military police. On April 6, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany and entered World War I. As the army prepared to ship troops to France to join its British allies on the Western Front, it once again recognized the need for provost units to keep soldiers in line. To form the units and act as provost marshal, or chief of police, the U.S. High Command chose Brigadier General Harry H. Bandholtz. Bandholtz had experience commanding Filipino police units during the Spanish-American War in 1898. The troops Bandholtz pulled together were actually the first to be called military police, 
and the first to wear MP armbands. General Bandholz and the others involved in this, they did their research. They looked back in history. They read what happened during the American Civil War and what was necessary. General Bandholz set forth lasting doctrine which established four basic MP functions. The first of those is called maneuver mobility support operations. Uh, that's basically combat traffic control, helping move men and equipment up to the front area from the rear, moving supplies up, you know, ensuring that the highways are open, what we call the lines of communications, the uh, main supply routes are open. It may involve doing convoy escorts in order to get those supplies through to reconnoitering additional routes or alternate routes in case they lose a route because of a bridge going down or some other kind of damage. The second primary MP function is rear area security. We're kind of the infantry in the rear, if you will. We're in the rear providing security to those support elements against uh, you know, their unconventional forces. They're going to try and come back and disrupt, sabotage, uh, create chaos. Military police are also tasked with handling enemy prisoners of war. They take prisoners off the hands of combat troops at the front and get them out of the fighting area as quickly as possible. The theory, the logic, the farther you move them from the lines, the less capable they're going back and, and getting, uh, getting, becoming an enemy again. Finally, MPs maintain law and order among the fighting troops. This includes investigating serious crimes. But this last duty, serious crime investigation, was new territory for MPs in 1917. Traditionally, Pinkerton detectives investigated felonies committed by armed forces personnel. In France, however, circumstances forced a special group of MPs to assume this responsibility. The army, almost overnight during those days, went from thousands to 500,000 of soldiers. And where Pinkertons can handle small investigations or the felony investigations in small units, we went worldwide with the United States Army. And when you're going overseas, the Pinkertons were not over there. The Army designated this new group of military detectives the Criminal Investigation Division, or CID. CID continues to function in the same capacity today. By the close of the Great War, General Bandholz had also formalized MP training. For the first time since the Revolution, U.S. military policemen had become schooled professionals. The General pleaded with his superiors to keep his professional force intact, yet shortly after the fighting ceased, the army again chose to disband the military police. The next world crisis would require MP training to start from scratch once again, and that crisis was just around the corner. In 1939, the attitude of U.S. leaders regarding the need for a full-time military police force changed overnight. Hitler's invasion of Poland in September raised concern for the safety of U.S. security installations. Congress soon authorized the formation of a centralized MP command. The military police corps, permanent this time, took shape on September 26, 1941. It began with an authorization for 2,000 policemen. By 1945, that number had swelled to over 200,000. World War II brought a phenomenal expansion to both the Army and the Navy. Aboard ship Masters at Arms, the MPs of the sea, continued in their traditional law enforcement capacity. But on shore, crew members were beyond the reach of their Masters at Arms. To ensure sailors behaved themselves at Liberty ports, personnel from each ship were assigned temporary shore patrol duty. They would go through the town, various areas. They would enforce what was off limits. Uh, establishments, for various reasons, could be declared off limits. So the shore patrolman had to know which of these establishments were, where they were, and basically enforce that sailors did not frequent these areas. They also were used in troop movements during World War II very extensively. Troop trains were heavily used during the Second World War, especially with Navy personnel. So they would accompany the Navy troop trains to make sure that the sailors were orderly, that they got fed, and things of that nature. MP duty in the Marine Corps was also a temporary assignment. 
the Marines would not create a permanent police force for several decades. The Air Force, while still part of the Army, required police for a new, non-traditional and exceedingly hazardous function, the defense of air bases. Military police in the Army ordinarily didn't have a combat role in World War II, although there are combat MPs standing close to the front line directing traffic and under fire. But it's not a combat role, per se. It's a support role. The Air Force police are defending bases in foxholes with weapons taking fire from the enemy and returning that fire. A constant threat for all MPs throughout the war was enemy infiltration into rear areas. For MPs in the Battle of the Bulge, one infiltration struck frighteningly close to home. In December of 1944, Hitler's army launched a last-ditch counteroffensive against Allied forces stalled along the German border. A key element of the attack plan was sabotage. The Germans uh, recruited from their regiments or from their ranks uh, English-speaking German soldiers, and they dressed them as military police, and they infiltrated our lines, and they caused chaos. They were directing traffic in different directions, exactly the opposite of where they're supposed to be going. The German infiltrators were commandos whose primary mission was to kill U.S. generals, including Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower. When word went out that German commandos dressed as American MPs were out to kill Ike, security operatives surrounded him to a point at which he could hardly function. But this reign of terror was short-lived. The imposters soon exhibited suspicious behavior that gave them away. Most were discovered by real MPs or other American soldiers and either captured or killed. At the end of the war, military policemen were part of the Allied occupying force in Germany. They guarded Nazi prisoners at the Nuremberg war crimes trials and executed condemned Germans at the trial's conclusion. Yet with the drawdown of forces following the war, by 1946, the MP Corps saw its numbers slashed to fewer than 19,000 members. A year later, the personnel count plummeted to just above 2,000, the same number as at the Corps' inception. Yet this time, the unit remained alive, and in the years to come, it would be forced to cope with a new and extreme form of military police work, combat support. By the 1950s, a military police unit had become a permanent organization within most branches of the armed forces. MPs accompanied U.S. troops to the war in Korea and carried out their traditional support role. But a decade later, MPs found themselves in a war that was anything but traditional. The war in Vietnam brought military police into direct combat with the enemy more often than any other U.S. military engagement before or since. MPs traditionally secured rear areas away from the battlefront. But the defining characteristic of the Southeast Asian conflict was that there were no defined front or rear areas. Throughout the war, the battlefront was a 360-degree perimeter. Even so, Army and Marine MPs carried out traditional police roles to the extent possible. Fulfilling their duties, however, often required them to trudge into the jungle on enemy search and destroy missions alongside regular troops. For Air Force MPs called security police, a critical concern was once again the defense of air bases. The Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army had no offensive air capability. This left them vulnerable to weapons fire and bombing from U.S. planes and helicopters. Their only defense was to destroy U.S. aircraft on the ground. Security police fended off ferocious assaults from enemy attackers throughout the war. One of their most serious challenges came in the early hours of January 31st, 1968. At 3 a.m., the Viet Cong launched an all-out offensive against U.S. installations and air bases across South Vietnam. 
Some of the fiercest fighting of the war took place during this series of attacks, later called the Tet Offensive. A key objective for the Viet Cong was the capture of Saigon, South Vietnam's capital city. Benoit Air Base, crucial to the defense of Saigon, fell under vicious assault. About midnight, an alert came down from 7th Air Force to every base in South Vietnam saying there's an attack coming, uh, full alert. Everyone on red alert condition two, all posts double manned, everybody's on 12-hour shifts, there's an attack coming. Now that sort of report had come down at least once a week for the previous two years. So people went out to their positions, but they really didn't expect attack. One o'clock came, no attack. Two o'clock came, no attack. Uh, people were getting tired, knowing this was another one of those false alarms. Three o'clock came, and all hell broke loose. Sitting in the path of the enemy's advance to the main Benoit airstrip was Bunker Hill 10, a concrete defense structure manned by a small number of Air Force security policemen. If Bunker 10 fell, the airbase would also fall. The VC launched the attack with a barrage of RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades. The captain of the base's security police, Reginald Maisie, was at the opposite end of the installation. Knowing the strategic importance of Bunker Hill 10, Maisie drove his vehicle through enemy fire to reach the position and lead its defense. When he arrived there, he found all the Viet Cong in the world coming through the perimeter, and there was nothing he could do about it. The first rocket round that the VC fired hit the machine gun at Bunker Hill 10. That left four men there with M16 rifles to hold off approximately 700 armed Viet Cong. Maisie radioed for help and formed a contingent of about 40 reinforcements in a defensive line with the bunker at its center. Several times during the fight, Captain Maisie left the security of the bunker to coordinate with the command post by radio. On one such trip, he was hit by enemy fire, but he continued to make reports and encourage his men. Helicopter gunships soon arrived to assist. On Maisie's final trip outside the bunker, he took a direct hit from an enemy rocket and was killed instantly. By this time, Staff Sergeant Pete Piazza, who was in charge of the resupply truck for that sector, had arrived and had been informed that someone had to take out those RPG people who were firing at the bunker. Well, he was one of the best shots with the grenade launcher in the squadron. He just happened to be there. Took up his 179, his single shot grenade launcher, and began exchanging shots with the RPG people and his 13th round hit their ammunition pod, blew them all sky high. And that was the end of the RPGs and most of the morale behind that attack on Bunker Hill 10. Due in large part to Reginald Maisie's selfless leadership and Pete Piazza's skill and heroism under fire, the Benoit security police repulsed the VC attack. But 20 miles south of Benoit in Saigon, army MPs at the US Embassy were in a fight of their own. That same day, an organized force of more than a dozen Viet Cong guerrillas blasted a hole through the perimeter wall of the U.S. Embassy compound. Unable to make entry into the embassy itself, the attackers took defensive positions behind large concrete planters which lined the building. A skeleton crew of embassy guards locked inside put out a call for help. Paul Healy and a few other members of the 716th Army MP Battalion the unit tasked with guarding Saigon were the first to respond. It was Healy's last shift as an MP in Vietnam. He was scheduled to return to the States the next day. Network news crews covering the fight at the embassy caught the young MP on film. We pulled the uh, Jeep up against the wall. Myself, I pulled one Jeep and a sergeant on the other side pulled the Jeep up and we could see over, standing on the windshield of the Jeep, we could see over and see inside the embassy. And but I shot two Vietnamese, because I had the angle, I shot two behind the flower pots. With covering fire from other MPs and a civilian government operative, Healy then made his way across the compound to the front of the embassy building. When I got to the door, a Viet Cong that I had shot from outside uh, 
threw a hand grenade it bounced off my leg and I and I fell to the ground and, and went behind another body another Viet, Viet Cong body and it I took the the brunt of the explosion and I, I shot the, uh, that Viet Cong the guards inside the embassy were in shock and would not open the door for Healy so he began fighting his way toward the ambassador's residence in the rear he used the concrete planters for cover and I got to the second flower pot, and I got down about uh, two feet away from it, and a Viet Cong jumped up, and I shot him was like as close as we are. And then I went a few more steps, and I was close to the corner of the building, and a Viet Cong uh, came up with his rifle, stood up in front of me, and and I shot uh, I shot him. Healy eventually encountered and killed all of the Viet Cong attackers except one. The last VC had made his way into a hiding place on the bottom floor of the residence. George Jacobson, an aide to the U.S. ambassador, was upstairs and unarmed. Jacobson leaned out the window, and Healy tossed him a pistol, two clips of ammunition, and a gas mask. The MPs then gassed the residence and pitched in a concussion grenade to dislodge the VC gorilla. The tear gas and the concussion grenade forced him out of his little uh, little uh, pantry, and he worked his way up the stairs in the tear gas. And when he got to the top of the stairs, uh, Judge Jacobson uh, shot him uh, with my 45. Back in Boston, Paul Healy's hometown, his mother recognized her son in the news coverage. It was uh, about 24 hours, a little more than that, before I could. Uh, get a line to tell her I was still alive. She was pretty, uh, was pretty tough on her. For his incredible valor in the face of the enemy, Paul Healy received the Distinguished Service Cross from the government of the United States. South Vietnamese officials awarded him their Medal of Honor. The stellar combat performance of MPs of all branches during the Tet Offensive changed the military's perception of how to use its police. It's a watershed event for my branches because based on that combat, uh, based on that just there, but throughout the company, but pretty much based on 716th, what they did at, at the American Embassy compound, we became a combat support arm. New Army doctrine soon required that all military police units be trained to assume a direct combat role. This increase in preparedness would serve MPs well. For in the coming decades, they would find themselves ever more frequently in harm's way. Military policemen are soldiers first. Despite their future roles as law enforcement officials, today, Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Force policemen and women must pass through the same basic training as every other member of the armed forces. Depending on branch of service and status as officer or enlisted, a recruit's basic training is 9 to 14 weeks of physical conditioning, intensive study, and incessant drill. A time when recruits must prove their physical and psychological fitness for military service. Those who pass the test advance to technical schools in their chosen career field. Prospective Army MPs train at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. For us, uh, we, we have what we call uh, OSIT, One Station Unit Training. So when a soldier comes uh, to, uh, to the MP school to become a military policeman, we put them through basic training and MP school. So we train them in the basic skills that every soldier gets trained in. And then, you know, we take them through the military police specific skills. So when they walk out and they graduate at the end of 17 weeks, they're ready to go to a unit uh, and perform as a basically trained military policeman or woman. I'm going give you the door command. Hey, you're going to fall out and get in my house, you understand? Yes, sir! Hey, you're going to attack my head, you understand? Yes, sir! Hey, you're going to make a head call and then you're going to get back online, you understand? Yes, sir! Marine Corps MP recruits undergo basic training elsewhere and then travel to Fort Leonard Wood for MP school. Soldiers and Marines often train side by side. 
they learn some basic laws, the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice. They learn about apprehensions and searches and seizures and basic uh, principles about collecting evidence and protecting crime scenes. They also qualify with the primary military police weapons, the 9mm pistol, the squad automatic rifle, and the Mark 19 grenade launcher. Go to the strong side, strong side, compliant escort position. And they learn unarmed self-defense. So we teach them some basic things, some takedowns. And some different methods of how to uh, in place hand irons. And you're going to swing this empty handcuff down toward the rear end and cuff up on the pinky side of their hand and snug it up. And conduct searches uh, as well. Those kind of things that uh, they're important once you decide that you're going to have to take somebody into custody uh, for their personal safety and the uh, safety of the military policemen as well. Students also train to deal with some of the more subjective aspects of police work. One of those aspects is just dealing with the public, whether the public is the dependent wives and children aboard the base or the Marines themselves. Uh, there's a requirement to understand the escalation of force, for example, being able to go from controlling people with just your voice, like civilian law enforcement officers do, up through the requirements for deadly force if necessary. The training culminates with exercises in combat tactics of the type called upon during civil disturbances. Good opportunity to expose them to that kind of threats where they got the obstacles. They may have to hoist somebody into a building through a window, search a building from the top down, unknown rooms, things around other corners, those kinds of things that not the average threat that you're used to, it's, it's there in front of you. It's kind of the unknown what's side and behind that door. And it keeps them thinking. As part of their training for quelling civil disturbances, the students don protective gear and learn how to conduct themselves as part of a riot control squad. They'll work the basics of, uh, of the formations and how to get into echelon left, echelon right, wedge formation, how to do what we call the stomp and drag. Those kinds of things that are fundamentally important to be out there and be organized and be able to uh, diffuse something. Hey, when you end up in that formation, it is hard to maintain your control. But you still have to keep your elbows up. You still have to maintain your position. You cannot let the line be broken. That's why you have the support behind you. Air Force MPs, now called security forces, and masters at arms, Navy MPs, train at Lackland Air Force Base near San Antonio, Texas. One of the unique aspects to the Navy's law enforcement training is we take sailors and other ratings, whether they be machinist mates, bosun mates, gunner's mates, and we bring them to the same academy. And they go to shore facilities and provide the same function as the master at arms. An effective training system used by the Navy is called FATS, Firearms Training Simulator. After learning basic handgun proficiency, students progress to a simulator room where crime scenarios play out on a screen in front of them. And with interactive technology, they're able to draw the weapon at the right time. They are able to engage the suspect if called for, and the machine will actually tell them their reaction time, good shoot, bad shoot, uh, and it gives them some real world applications. Taking to heart lessons learned in Vietnam and elsewhere, Air Force security training emphasizes combat tactics. We take a lot of that from the United States Army and follow a lot of their guidance from their field manuals to conduct our training. So I think a lot of it's comparable. Just our missions are different because given the location. Lackland Air Force Base is also home to the Military Working Dog School. Working dogs have a long history of service with the military police. MPs used sentry dogs for base security in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Dogs have saved the lives of countless MP sentries by alerting their handlers to the presence of enemy soldiers waiting in ambush. With the growing use of military police in peacekeeping operations, Working dogs and dog handlers are very much in demand. 
They've been a critical part of uh, our peacekeeping operations uh, in Bosnia and in Kosovo. You know, a dog has got a, uh, a significant uh, effect. It doesn't necessarily have to be an attack dog, doesn't necessarily have to be a narcotics dog. Just the presence of that has got people wondering, you know, what's that dog doing out there? And I'll tell you this, there, you can have all the explosive detection equipment you want in the world, but it still takes a dog to tell you finally that you actually have an explosive there. They still use them in that role. So I don't think you can replace the dog. The military police schools work diligently to prepare MPs for basic operations in the field and garrison. If I need to get control of him, I can put him right up on his toes and talk to him. Don't resist me. But an individual's ultimate survival in the many dangerous situations encountered on the job finally depends on his or her ability to exercise sound judgment under pressure. You're out there as the eyes and ears of the commander. You're protecting the installation from people that, that would harm them. Uh, so that's a lot of time aboard them, salon, surrounded by some really significant emotional events. Events that sooner rather than later will confront most MPs with life or death decisions. Good evening, Sergeant. Good evening, Corporal Lee. How you doing? I'm doing good, Sergeant. What's your Marine Corps order on Delhi Force? Marine Corps order on Delhi Force is 5500.6 Foxtrot. What's your fifth general order? My fifth general order, Sergeant, is to quit my post only when properly relieved. What are two instances when you'd employ Delhi Force? Two incidents which I would employ Delhi Force would be to prevent escape and by lawful order. Very well. Carry on. Military police guarding and patrolling government installations in the U.S. must be every bit as cautious and vigilant as their counterparts in combat zones across the globe. Garrison MPs often find themselves in life-threatening circumstances. What they essentially do is the same law enforcement function that you will find done in any town, in any county in the United States of America. They respond to the same types of crimes. Fortunately, we've got a smaller population and a much more regimented population than the American population at large. So we don't have the same level of problems, but we are a microcosm of American society. So we do have some cases of rapes, robberies, murders, etc. Uh, those kind of things do take place. Regardless of their assigned duty, MPs must always be prepared for the unexpected. At any moment, you could be called upon to step in and react to a threat. Uh, you could have a, a hostage situation on base. You could have somebody trying to uh, enter your base into your nuclear restricted area. And in those types of situations, your training and everything else has to come into play. MPs approaching cars on routine traffic stops may suddenly find themselves endangered. You pull a vehicle over that you thought was for a, uh, a bad headlight. And, uh, you know, they had just come on post uh, from robbing the 7-Eleven downtown. And they think you know that. And obviously, a situation like that can deteriorate. MPs must remain equally ready to put their policing skills to work across the globe. Greater use of NATO peacekeeping forces in politically volatile regions around the world has placed military police in an increasingly important role. From 1941, or right prior to World War II, to the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 89, the Army was used about 11 times. From, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall to today, the Army has had a 333% increase of deployments. When you're a National Command Authority, or when you're a SYNC Commander-in-Chief, and you want to bring in something that assists you and doesn't accelerate what's going on or make it worse or make it degenerate into a brawl. It's a different political signature when you send a military police outfit in. In the 1990s alone, American MPs have assisted the Kurds in Iraq, protected refugees in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, taken part in Operation Provide Relief in Kenya, and restored hope in Somalia. Currently, they face danger every day, keeping the peace between ethnic Albanians and Serbians in Kosovo. It's a mission that presents an odd mix of physical and psychological challenges. 
happened. You are now dealing in a country that's infrastructure is shattered. You're dealing with a, a, a population that's against each other. And you're supposed to establish peace so that the governmental functions can take control. It's tough to do that during a firefight. It's tough to do that when you're blowing up the infrastructure. It's tough to do that when a family can't sit in its house and be assured that it's not going to be bombed or the house set on fire. So that's kind of the mission set you're kind of walking into. First Sergeant John Amabili spent six and a half months in the troubled region. We encountered every aspect of law enforcement from uh, assaults to rape to murder. It's a country with no law enforcement except for the U.S. Army. One afternoon, my commander and I, we went to uh, visit the Serbian gentleman that lived uh, in the town of Jelani in an Albanian sector of town. He lived in a, uh, an apartment building that was owned by an Albanian. Uh, he was about 61, 65 years old. It was him and his wife. And uh, we had just got done talking to him. We drove 35 miles away to check on another incident that was taking place. On our way back to our base camp, we uh, were listening to our uh, radio frequency and uh, determined that there was some incident going down in the town of Jelani. We went right back to where we had just been maybe an hour and a half prior, and the gentleman had been shot dead right through the head. That was the kind of stuff we dealt with here. We had just talked to this guy, and an hour and a half later, he was laying there dead. While confronting such tragedies can be emotionally trying, for many MPs, another aspect of peacekeeping offers great emotional rewards. When they're out there interacting with the public and the kids and they feel that they're really making a difference every day that they're out there, I think that's what, uh, what keeps these young kids around. We don't often see that piece of it. And, and when you talk to those kids when they come back from those things, uh, they'll turn around and volunteer to go back. The United States military police has become one of the first groups called upon in times of world crisis. An ironic turn of events for a group that spent much of its early history struggling for organizational permanence. And in the current geopolitical climate, it is likely that MPs will be asked to assume greater responsibilities in the future. Even so, as they have done throughout US history, the military police stand ready to serve those who serve.